So a little while ago, I made a video covering some mysterious things in Pokemon games that haven't been explained to this point. It was a really fun topic, and you guys really enjoyed it, which I really appreciate, so thank you so much for the support on that video. With that said, since you guys enjoyed it so much, I figured I would do it again. So I am here again today looking at five more mysterious things in the Pokemon games that just have not been explained for whatever reason. We're gonna get into them, we're gonna ask ourselves why they haven't been explored, and see if we can't figure out what the answers to these mysterious things might have been. So with that said, let's check it out. Today's unexplained Pokemon mysteries that we're about to get into are made possible in part by today's sponsor, Zbiotics. Zbiotics is a probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is most responsible for those rough mornings that one can feel after drinking. How it works is you simply drink a bottle of Zbiotics shortly before you plan on drinking, and then you'll be good for the night. If you drink responsibly, pace yourself, and get a good night's sleep, Zbiotics will help you to feel refreshed the next day and ready to make the most of it. With the holiday season officially upon us as well, odds are you might attend a few more get-togethers than usual, and feeling at your best is more important than ever during this special time of year, which Zbiotics can help you keep doing while also allowing you to have a good time with your friends and family. It has also been rigorously tested, is FDA compliant for safety, and offers a 100% money-back guarantee if you're not satisfied. So, if Zbiotics sounds like something that might be up your alley, you can use my link in the description below to check it out. And when you use code HIPHOP at checkout, you'll also get 15% off your first order. Again, check that out with the link below, and a big thank you to Zbiotics for supporting the channel. Alrighty, so the first one on our list is a fairly obvious and well-known one, but it's also one that definitely has to be talked about when you're talking about mysterious, unexplained things in Pokemon, and that would be the subject of the Kalos Power Plant. I'll try to keep this concise since you probably all know the general story of this by now, but basically the Kalos Power Plant is a big sprawling location within the Kalos region, and it's a very significant one as well. However, what's mysterious about it is that there are a lot of doors to this facility that are locked when you come upon them in the game, but they stay locked throughout the rest of your adventure, and you're never able to see what's behind them, and why this is 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 never explained in any way. You do visit the inside of the power plant as one of your encounters with Team Flare, but this only has you going through one of the multiple different accessible doors to this facility. And as I said earlier, all the other ones are simply locked for the entire game with no way of unlocking them. So what is the deal with the Kalos power plant? Are these multiple other doors just for show? Is it an oversight of some kind by the developers? Or is there something bigger going on here? Well, I think it's fairly safe to say that option number three is fairly likely, and that's that there was indeed something more going on here at some point. While it is always possible that these extra doors could have just been decoration for the overworld, with all of the hubbub and talk about Pokemon Z, both at the time and especially recently with its recent confirmation that there was an additional game planned for Kalos, but it was cancelled, it's very, very possible that those extra power plant doors and accessible areas of the power plant were meant to be a part of that Pokemon Z experience. And while the following part of this idea is entirely speculative, it has been speculated by a lot of people that these additional areas of the power plant that were not able to access might have been tied to Volcanion in some way. Because Volcanion is a mythical Pokemon introduced in the Kalos region that really doesn't have any tie to anything that goes on in Gen 6, compared to the other two mythicals, like Diancie and Hoopa, that at least have a tie to something that happens in this generation with Diancie being a mutated Carbink, and Hoopa being the reason for all the Mirage spots that happen later on in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. 
And given that Volcanion is also a Pokémon that is fairly man-made as well, and its theme of steam could also fit in with the idea of a power plant, it could have been possible that Volcanion was tied to some event that was planned to happen in this location, possibly maybe as a distribution event for Pokémon Z, that of course was canned when Pokémon Z was canned. This makes the Kalos power plant just another painful reminder of how much we really did lose out on in the Kalos region. However, I feel like all of this stuff that they did cut out of Pokemon X and Y could be revisited when they eventually revisit Kalos in the next 20 years or so. So come generation 15, when we're all 50 years old, it's probably going to be a pretty exciting time for Kalos fans, so I guess we have that to look Look forward to. For the second point on this list, we are going to be going backwards one generation to the Unova games and looking at none other than Getsis, and more specifically, what the heck happened to his right arm and his eye. This is something that isn't addressed at all in the games, it's left as a very, very subtle detail, but if you pay close attention to Getsis, specifically his design, you'll notice that both his right arm and his right eye are covered by his cloak and that weird eye patch thing he has on, respectively. Getsis is also very careful to keep his right arm under that cloak, meaning it never comes out for any reason whatsoever, and we only ever see him using his left hand. That is, except during the opening movie to Pokemon Black and White, where we see Getsis coronating N as the king of Team Plasma, and we see his right arm holding up N's crown for a brief moment. And the interesting thing here is that his right arm is completely black. So clearly something happened to Getsis here that left him pretty deformed and is the reason why he's having to cover himself up so much. But the game never touches on this in any way whatsoever, and it's basically a piece of environmental world building where we're left to just wonder what happened to him if we even notice any of these details at all. There have been some theories over the years, however, attempting to explain what is going on with Getsis in this respect. The most prominent of which being that he was possibly attacked by Qrem at some point in the past, after either encountering it accidentally, or trying to catch it on his own, and this would ultimately result in all his injuries, and more specifically, in his arm getting frostbitten, which would explain why it is completely black in the intro cutscene. And this can potentially lead us down a big rabbit hole that explains a lot of Getsis' backstory and the existence of Team Plasma as a group. Because after Getsis potentially encountered QRM on his own and got wrecked by it, he realized he wasn't going to be able to capture this kind of powerful Pokemon on his own, and thus started to form a plan to seek some help, both of a big group of people, which would explain the formation of Team Plasma, and of other powerful individuals, which would explain why he seeked out N, and why he recruited him to Team Plasma when he realized he could communicate with Pokemon. And honestly, I am just now thinking about this as I am recording this video, but all of this could be very symbolically represented in Getsis' own design, because as we mentioned earlier, he is very covered up in his attire, and this could be meant to represent not only him covering up his true intentions with Team Plasma, but also covering up his weaknesses and failures of the past, and his subsequent attempts to use use Team Plasma to try and cover up those failures. That honestly sounds like it makes a lot of sense to me, but as far as an official explanation goes, the games haven't even begun to touch on this aspect of Getz's character, let alone explain it, so we're probably just gonna have to keep theorizing for the time being. This next one is one that I haven't really seen a whole lot of people talk about, but it really interests me personally, because it is the definition of a mystery that has gone completely unexplained to this point, and it's a fairly recent one at that. 
In the Isle of Armor DLC expansion for Pokemon Sword and Shield, after you defeat Mustard for the final time and basically complete the DLC, Mustard says something very, very ominous. He starts talking about how you should come battle him more from time to time so that you can both get stronger. And then he says, quote, just so we're ready for when the time comes. That already sounds really ominous on its own, but then he follows it up by saying, oh, don't worry, you'll find out what I'm talking about eventually. So Mustard is obviously referring to something specific here, and not only is he referring to something, he basically confirms that he is talking about something specific when he tells us that we'll find out what it is he is actually talking about. But the thing is, it doesn't seem like we've found out what that is to this point. Granted, it has only been a couple of years since the DLC released, so this could still be addressed or resolved at some point, but if anything, you would think that this would have been foreshadowing maybe Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, or maybe the Diamond and Pearl remakes, or even Legends Arceus, but the thing is, it doesn't seem to be connecting to any of those, because Mustard is very generically just saying we should battle more to get stronger so that we're ready for when this thing happens. There's no specific mention of anything that can tie this moment to any of the games that came after this DLC, at least to this point. And that's why I find this particular bit of dialogue so interesting, because a lot of times when you have similar moments like these in Pokemon games, it can ultimately just be amounted to you looked too far into it and you saw something that wasn't intended to be there. But with this particular moment with Mustard, it makes it a lot more explicit that something specific is being referred to here, because Mustard himself confirms it by saying that you will find out what he is talking about eventually. And since the thing he is referring to involves needing to battle to get prepared for it, it doesn't seem like it's a very good thing whatever it is. However, it doesn't seem like we have had any confirmation or final resolution as to what he is referring to, and that's what makes it so perplexing. As I mentioned, I thought it might be referring in some way to one of the upcoming games that came out after the DLC, but it doesn't seem like there's any direct connection there, so this one truly is an unexplained mystery that's hard to even speculate about. So you guys are going to have to let me know all of your thoughts, opinions, and ideas for this one in the comments below. This next one is still very theoretical in terms of its possibility, but it presents a very interesting idea, and that is the idea of Magearna's original purpose. Magearna is a mythical Pokemon that was introduced in Gen 7, and in fact, it was the very first Generation 7 Pokemon to be introduced. But it seems like there is something more going on with Magearna than meets the eye, and what we ultimately get to see in the final games. Because based on certain things, it seems like Magearna was possibly intended for a much different role in the games initially. And as much as I hate to beat a dead horse, it does seem like Magearna could have possibly been another part to that cancelled Pokemon Z title that we were talking about earlier. And this is for a plethora of reasons. First off, Everything about Magearna's design screams Kalos, from the cyberpunk aesthetic it has going on with its gear-based body, to the dress that it is wearing that is literally modeled after historical European attire. So it just seems like Magearna was very specifically designed with the Kalos region in mind, instead of for Alola, which it seems to fit in with not nearly as well. You could even make the argument that its design as the original Pokeball could have been tied to Kalos too, because there is quite literally a Pokeball factory in Kalos that it very possibly could have been connected to if all this were the case. 
And one thing that we definitely know was planned for Pokemon Z, Complete Zygarde, ended up in Sun and Moon just the same way that Magearna ended up in Sun and Moon. So there are a lot of signs that point towards the fact that Magearna could have possibly been intended for the Kalos games, possibly to be introduced in Pokemon Z in some way, but when all of that fell apart, it was just shoved into Sun and Moon in the same way that Complete Zygarde was. That seems like a very likely possibility in my opinion, but it's just a theory. The one thing I think we can say for sure though, is that Magearna did in fact have an original purpose of some kind, a purpose it was not able to fulfill in Pokemon Sun and Moon. And what that original purpose was ultimately supposed to be, whether it was in Pokemon X and Y or in Sun and Moon, is a mystery that I would really personally like to find more answers to, and hopefully further down the line, we'll get to find out what some of those answers are. For our fifth mystery of the video, I've got one that doesn't really get talked about a whole lot for as interesting as it truly is, and that would concern the third tower of the Johto region. The Johto region is obviously known for its two iconic towers, the Bell Tower and the Brass Tower, which originally housed both Lugia and Ho-Oh before one of them burned to the ground in a fire and Lugia subsequently fled to the Whirl Islands. What doesn't get talked about hardly at all with this story though is that there was actually a third tower originally as well, and it sat in Goldenrod City. Right after you defeat Team Rocket in the Goldenrod Radio Tower and get them to disband once again, the Radio Tower Director will come and thank you by giving you either the Silver Wing or the Rainbow Wing, which will allow you to access either Lugia or Ho-Oh. He then goes on to say that these wings were found in a tower that once stood where the Radio Tower now sits, and it was torn down and replaced with the Radio Tower some time ago. Based on his description of the tower though, and the fact that either the Silver Wing or the Rainbow Wing were found there depending on which version of the game you're playing, it seems that this third tower was a part of a group with the other two towers that sit in Ecruteak City, and not only were they all part of a matching set it seems, but the legendary Pokemon seemingly also used them given that their wings were found in the rubble after the tower was torn down. Given that these towers are central to what the Johto region is all about and are hugely important to its story, the prospect of a third one that was torn down is extremely fascinating, especially when you consider that the two towers that still stand are and were once associated with legendary Pokemon, so it makes you wonder if this third one could have been associated with another legendary Pokemon as well. It's mentioned so briefly within the story of Gold and Silver that it's very easy to forget about, but in my opinion it is a really interesting facet of the Johto region and its history, and it honestly makes me wonder what this tower was like and what its role could have been when it was up and running. This is another one that is hard to speculate any further on, but there is obviously a lot of potential here for a really cool story to be told, so you guys are going to have to let me know all your thoughts, opinions, and possible ideas for this in the comments below as well. Ultimately though, I want to hear your thoughts and ideas about all of these mysteries, so be sure to let me know what you think of these and what your personal answers to these mysteries are in the comments below as well. Also, be sure to give the video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe for more if you're new, and with that said, I will be back with another new video very soon. So until then, as always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, I really appreciate it, and I will smell you guys later.